Okay, so what are we going to do this lecture? We're going to keep talking about maximum flow. So last week we talked about a few maximum flow algorithms, and all of them are what's known as augmenting path algorithms for the obvious reason. You know, each iteration of those algorithms, you find some path in the residual graph, and then you augment it by routing additional flow along that path. So in the first lecture, we saw the ford fulkerson algorithm. So that's where you just pick an arbitrary uh, path from S to T in the residual graph to augment. That's not even polynomial time algorithm. That's only a pseudo-polynomial time algorithm. Then on Thursday, we talked about the edmonds karp specialization of ford fulkerson That's where amongst all the ST paths in the residual graph, you pick the shortest one, the one with the fewest number of hops. That gave us a polynomial running time bound. It wasn't very good. It's just O of m squared times n. But, you know, it's a start. And then we also talked about Dynick's algorithm briefly, although it, that'll be developed more in problem set number one, which was this idea of augmenting through blocking flows. And with the implementation on the problem set, we'll get a little bit better of a runtime bound of uh, n squared m. So that's the story so far. The goal for this lecture is to teach you a different paradigm for maximum flow algorithm design, known as the push relabel paradigm. And uh, so to this day, in fact, push relabel algorithms are often the method of choice in practice. They're really very, very fast in practice, even if they've never sort of quite won the grand championship of worst case running time bounds. In practice, they do really, really well. So that's why I want to I want to devote a whole lecture to it, because it's really something uh, you might use in your own work in the future. So to introduce push relabel, let me just sort of give you a motivating example of why you might want an algorithm which does something other than augmenting paths. So for some parameter k, think of k as like 10,000 or something, something big. Imagine you have a network that looks like this. So you have a bunch of edges with capacity k, and let's just say you have k of these edges. So k will mean several different things in this example. So you have a path of k edges, 10,000 edges, each with a capacity 10,000. Here's your sink. And then x is connected to the sink by lots of disjoint paths that are only unit capacity each. And let's say the number of these paths is k. Okay. So this obviously is some flow network. You might be given this as input for all you know. Okay. So what can you say, so how long would it take, say, the ford fulkerson algorithm to compute a max flow in this instance as a function of k? What was the guess? K squared. K squared. That, that's uh, absolutely right. So, uh, so each iteration of ford fulkerson takes linear time. Um, and indeed, it's going to have to, you know, when you do breadth first search or depth first search, you're going to have to search down this whole long path of length roughly k. So each iteration takes k time. And unfortunately, you'll only be able to uh, route one unit of flow each time. Okay, because you'll be able to, you know, th these don't bind, but, you know, you have these unit capacities on the right. So you have a full k iterations with k time each. So that's k squared. Okay, the max flow value here is k. So, you know, intuitively you're like, okay, how, how can we do better at least on this network? Well, you look at this and you kind of say, well, what we really kind of want to do is just like flood this path, you know, just route k units. So spend linear time, linear in k, getting flow to x, and then spend linear time just distributing it amongst the theta of k different edges. If we could do that, that would be a linear time algorithm for max flow in this particular instance. Okay, we wouldn't waste all this work just sort of recomputing these long paths over and over and over again. So that's sort of the high level intuition behind what uh, push relabel algorithms are trying to do. Yeah. All right. On the other hand, you know, it's not so simple, right? I mean, this is just one example. If there were only, if there were less than k paths over here, and we tried to flood this path, we'd push k units of flow to x, and then we actually wouldn't have enough capacity to push it the rest of the way to t. So then we'd have some excess flow here, and we'd have to sort of send it back to the source, right, if there were less than k paths. So, you know, the question is, you know, is there any way to implement this idea systematically so that it always works no matter what the graph is, whether it looks like this graph or whether it looks like something totally different? So, a uh, simple but important definition for us is that of a preflow 
So this is the same thing as a flow, except the conservation constraints are a bit relaxed. Remember, the conservation constraints was our way of saying that the flow in should equal the flow out at every vertex other than S and T. And if you think about this idea of sort of flooding the network, you know, before this flow has reached all the way to T, you're not going to have conservation. Right? You might have sort of excess, uh, say at the node X, if you had fewer than K paths. So a pre-flow is just, it just relaxes the conservation condition in a natural way. Okay, so it's a vector indexed by edges, and it satisfies two things. First of all, it satisfies the usual non-negativity and capacity constraints. So these are exactly the capacity constraints that we had for flows. And then instead of flow in equals flow out, we're going to allow the flow into a vertex to be possibly larger than the flow out. Okay? But not smaller. Okay? So only more flow can go into a vertex than go out of a vertex. Uh, and this is except at S. So of course at S, there's going to be zero flow in and some amount of flow out. Okay? And again, you know, why this relaxation? Think about this case where we're sort of trying to push flow through this network and we're at some intermediate point. Right, so whatever, you know, whatever the frontier of our pushing the flow is going to be, there's going to be more coming in than there is going out. Okay, so that's why we want this relaxation. Clear? Okay. So remember there is this totally key concept of a residual graph. We talked about this at length last week. So you have a flow in a network, then you get a corresponding residual graph where you have forward edges with residual capacity UE minus FE and reverse arcs with residual capacity F sub E. Notice that, you know, with a pre-flow, we can just as well form exactly the same residual network as we could with a flow. Okay? Again, we just edge by edge, do the forward arc, do the reverse arc with the appropriate residual capacities. It, this relaxation doesn't uh, doesn't uh, screw up our residual network construction. So for preflow F, we define the residual network or residual graph GF as before. Okay. All right. So the next concept is we want some way, you know, at the end of the day, right, so we're going to have algorithms which in their intermediate stages maybe have a preflow which is not a flow the conservation constraints will be violated. Of course, by the time one of these algorithms terminates, it better give us a flow, right? The maximum flow problem, you can't output a preflow. You have to output a flow. So we need to work toward arriving at a flow, work toward conservation constraints. So we want a measure of how badly we're violating the conservation constraints. So for a fixed flow F, The excess of a vertex is just the difference between these two quantities. Okay. Flow in minus flow out. Okay. And for a preflow, this translates to saying that all of these excesses will be non-negative. Okay. Again, except well, we're not thinking about the source in the sink. We're thinking about the rest of the vertices. Okay. So flow just means all the excesses are equal to zero. With a preflow, you, you might have strict inequality here. You might have some positive excesses. Okay, preflow is a flow if and only if it has no vertices with positive excess. Okay, everything clear so far? All right. So to turn a preflow into a flow, we basically have to kind of you know squash these excesses. We have to get rid of the excesses. Okay. So next we need to understand what does it mean? How, do, how are we going to modify preflows in an algorithm? Okay? When we were working with flows, our hands were kind of tied. Right? We had to maintain the conservation constraints at all times, so that naturally motivated pushing flow on an ST path. Okay? Because that maintains the invariant, the conservation constraints are satisfied. Now that we're actually allowing ourselves to violate the conservation constraints, we have more flexibility in how we augment one of these preflows. We don't have to use a path. Okay. So in fact, what we're going to do is we're only going to push flow along a single edge of the network in one step. Okay. So they're called push-relabel algorithms. So let me tell you about 
push. So again, you want to think there's some fixed graph, there's some current flow in that graph. Okay, and then there's a corresponding residual graph, like usual. So all right, so some pre-flow F in the graph. So the subroutine, I'll give you, you know, I'm going to unveil the whole algorithm step by step. So this will be a subroutine in the whole algorithm, push. So suppose you look at a vertex V, and now you want to, and you're thinking of V as being a vertex with excess, and you're trying to get rid of the excess. You're trying to move it somewhere else in the network, okay? So what do you do? Well, you hope there's some outgoing edge in the residual graph that has positive residual capacity, okay? So choose, so you start at V, you look at the outgoing edges in the residual graph. And again, so for this whole lecture, unless I specify otherwise, when I say an edge in the residual graph, I always mean an edge with positive residual capacity. Okay, so all those zeros, just think of them as deleted from the residual graph. Okay? So you want to find an outgoing edge from V in the residual graph with positive uh, residual capacity. And then you just want to route as much flow as you can on the edge from V to W. Okay? Now, if you think about it, there's actually two different constraints on how much flow you can push from V to W. Okay? The one which you're very used to is the capacity constraint. So if the residual capacity is six, you can only push six units of flow along that edge, okay, just like before. But now, remember, we need to have this flow in as at least flow out, or equivalently, excesses need to be non-negative. So if you have a vertex and its excess is only three, even if the residual capacity of this outgoing arc is six, you can only send three units of flow. That drives the excess down to zero, and we're not allowed to make it negative. So delta is just the smaller of these two possible bottlenecks, the most we could possibly push without violating any constraints. So the minimum of V's excess and the residual capacity of E. Okay? Where this is defined in the usual way in residual networks. Okay, so there's the forward arcs, there's the backward arcs, et cetera. Okay? And now what do you do? You push delta units on this edge. And so this augmentation works exactly the same way as in path augmentation. If this edge E corresponds to a forward edge of some network, then you increase the flow on that edge in the original network. If this is a backward edge, then increasing by delta really means you reduce the flow in the original network on this edge. Okay, so just like in augmenting paths. So that's the push subroutine, okay? So notice that if there wasn't already an excess at W, this is going to create an excess at W, right? Because when you push on VW, you increase the flow going into W, but you're not increasing the flow going out of W, okay? So the excess will definitely be positive after the push. It might have been positive already beforehand, okay? All right, so that's a basic subroutine, the push subroutine. So you change a preflow just by increasing or decreasing the flow on a single edge at once. Now, this isn't going to be good enough. We need some more ideas to get a you know, bona fide max flow algorithm. And one thing we could be concerned about is just pushing flow around in cycles forever. So think about the following network. say with all unit edge capacities. So, you know, if you push some flow here and you get an excess of one here, you can then push on this edge. That just moves the excess over here. You can push on this edge. That moves the excess down here. Of course, you want to push it to T, but, you know, conceivably, if you don't know what you're doing, you could just push this around the cycle over and over again. Okay? So just because you zero out the excess at one vertex, it doesn't automatically mean you're making progress. It might just be like that excess reappears at some other vertex. Okay? So it could be an infinite game of whack-a-mole, if, you know if you know what that is. Okay? All right, so we need some principled way of figuring out how to, how to apply pushes so that this doesn't happen. So that first of all, we terminate, but then also second of all, of course, we want to be correct. We want to max flow at the end of the day. So, 
Here's the nice idea we're going to use to argue all the correctness properties of this algorithm. For each vertex, we're going to give it a height. And I really encourage you to like think about a graph now as just living in 3D. Okay? So all the vertices have an xy coordinate, and then the height just corresponds to a z coordinate. So there's a notion of some vertices being higher than other vertices. Okay? So you maintain a height for each vertex, subject to three invariants. And the first two invariants are sort of very simple. The third one is the interesting one. Uh, so first of all, the height of the source is just n. So remember, n is the number of vertices. Okay? And it never changes. Okay? That's an invariant. Source is always at height n. The sink is always at height 0. Okay? And again, it never changes. So all the action, all the heights, they only change on the other vertices, other than s and t. And so here's the interesting invariant. The interesting invariant says that at all times, in the residual network, the current residual network, the arcs of the network, again, arcs with positive residual capacity, uh, they, let's see, so they basically they can't go downhill too quickly. Okay, so let me write that in math. So for all edges in the residual graph from V to W, H of V, so this is the tail, is at most one more than the height of the head. So for a picture, now you have a vertex V, and it has three outgoing neighbors, and suppose it just so happens that the three neighbors are at the heights 3, 4, and 6. Then for this invariant to be true, V better be at most what? What's the biggest, no what's the biggest height I can give to V and have the invariant still hold? 4. 4, good. Right, so basically, it can only be one more than any of the outgoing edges. So it has to be at most one more in particular than the minimum of the vertices on outgoing edges. So this 3 constrains V's height to be at most 4. Okay? So what we see from this example is that edges in the... So if this is satisfied, then there's three cases for edges in the residual network. They can go uphill, like from V to W3. They can stay flat, like from V to W2. And if they go downhill, they only go downhill one step. Okay. That's the case of V from W to W1. Okay. Now, I don't ask you to have an intuition for these invariants yet. I'll explain where they come from in a second. But can everyone sort of parse them clearly? Does everyone understand what they're saying? All right, so where, where do these, how would you ever think of these invariants? Where would these come from? Well, here's the point. So I claim that if the invariants hold, then a familiar condition is true. Namely, the residual graph at this moment in time does not have a path from S to T. S and T are disconnected in the current residual graph. So stare at these invariants, 1 through 3, for a little bit and see if you can see why this is true. Why they imply that S and T have to be disconnected in the residual graph. Anyone have a proposal? <laughs> <laughs> 
why that's true? Is it a hand or? Yeah. Because if we need to go down for one stamp, so every time we can go down at most of one stamp, the, the pass from S to D is at most of one, and minus one, we don't have one. Very good. Yep. So let me, let me repeat that proof. It was absolutely correct. So think about traverse. So suppose by contradiction there was a path from S to T in the residual graph. Okay. How many edges could it possibly have? N minus 1. That's the longest a path can be in the graph. So by the first invariant, you start at height N. You traverse this alleged path that exists to T. You traverse at most N minus 1 edges. You go downhill only one step each time. Yet somehow you're supposed to wind up at height zero. Okay? So that's a contradiction. Right? So we take n steps to get from s to t in the residual graph, but there, there's not, the shortest path length is not, is not n. It's n minus 1 at most. Okay? Now remember, from last week, we're very familiar with this condition, a residual graph not having an st path. If f is a flow and there's no st path in the residual graph, that's equivalent to being a maximum flow. Remember, that was our big structural result from the beginning of the second lecture. Okay? Now, if f is a preflow and not a flow, it's not feasible, so we can't call it a max flow. But if you have a preflow f, which happens to be feasible, it happens to be a flow f, and there's no st path, then you know you're done. Then you know you have a maximum flow. Okay? So if you both satisfy the invariance, Plus, you satisfy the conservation constraints, not the relaxed version, the original flow in equals flow out version for flows, then this implies that you're optimal. Okay? So that's where these come from. Okay, so basically you're thinking, how do we know what, uh, then we're done? Okay, what do we want to be true at the end of the algorithm? We have our optimality condition that there's no ST path in the visual graph. And then it turns out maintaining heights works great. And then you say, what are sufficient conditions on these heights so that we know that S and T are disconnected? And these invariants are those conditions. Okay. It's interesting to compare and contrast this approach, this paradigm, to what we were doing with augmenting paths. How did every one of our augmenting paths algorithms work? Well, it maintained as an invariant at all times feasibility. Okay? It always maintained a flow. Initially the zero flow and then these augmentations. Conservation constraints were always satisfied. The goal, what the algorithms worked toward, was to reach a residual graph with no ST path. Okay? So the invariant was feasibility. The goal was to disconnect S and T. Here, it's exactly the opposite. Okay? So the invariants are insisting that S and T are disconnected in the residual graph, and what we have to work toward is restoring feasibility, transforming a preflow into a flow. Okay? So there's sort of this symmetry between them, but I think most people uh, find the first paradigm much more natural, right? that you sort of you know, insist on feasibility all the time and then get better and better and better. But it turns out to be a really good idea to relax feasibility and restore it only at the end of the algorithm. And that's the sort of key idea behind push relabel algorithms. I also think that's why, so this paradigm is from the mid 80s, whereas the augmenting pass algorithms are from the 50s and 60s and early 70s. So I think this is a little sort of less of an obvious paradigm to come up with than augmenting paths. Okay. And I guess just, one, just to reiterate one point from last week when I was contrasting CS161 and 261. So the maximum flow problem, we know it's polytime solvable. We already have a couple polytime algorithms for it. But still, it's sufficiently complex that it kind of demands our respect. Okay, we can't just sort of, we know that we can't just make up some random algorithm off the top of our heads and hope that it's going to be correct. Right? That's sort of where we started lecture number one. So for these harder problems in P, like maximum flow and the even harder ones that we'll stare at, you really need to have a plan, a strategy, when you're coming up with your algorithm. So you need to sort of be clear in your head about how do I know when I'm done, what are the optimality conditions, and what is my systematic way of algorithmically getting closer and closer to those conditions. So we're seeing another instance of that, what I was calling a two-step uh, paradigm from, from last week. Okay. All right. So, I want to now tell you an actual push relabel algorithm. And uh, this algorithm is going to maintain these three invariants. Uh, 
But we actually need to just think, for starters, about how do we even satisfy these invariants at the very beginning of the algorithm. Okay. So there'll be a main loop, but I want to talk about the initialization a little bit. Now, in our augmenting path algorithms, initialization was trivial. We just started with the all zero flow. Okay. Now, notice here, these invariants actually reference two things. They reference a residual graph, and therefore a current preflow f. It also references a height function. Okay, so for initialization, I need to tell you what the initial f is. I need to tell you what the initial h is. Okay. All right. Well, uh, it's kind of obvious we should just set the height of the source to n. We don't really have any choices by the first invariant, and uh, we're going to set all other heights to zero. Okay. So in particular, we're going to set the height of the sink to zero as required, but also everything else. So h of v equals zero for all other vertices. Okay? So that's going to be the height function. But I still have to tell you the initial preflow. So here's a question for you. Suppose we did the obvious thing, and we initialized the algorithm with the all zero preflow and this height function. Would that satisfy all the invariants? Why not? Exactly right. So the answer is, think about any edge which goes out of the source S. Right? So it starts at height n, and then one hop goes to height 0. Right? But what's our third invariant? It says you can only go downhill one step at a time. Right? So all of the edges outside, out of, going out of S violate the invariant. So we can't start with the all zero flow. And actually, we really just can't, if we, if we insist on this height function, we cannot have these edges outgoing from S in the residual graph. Okay? It's just not allowed. So how do we kick out all of those outgoing edges from S from the residual graph? We just saturate them. Okay? And then the reverse arcs appear, but the forward version of the arcs disappear, because okay? we've saturated them. So that's the initialization. So for all edges out of S, we saturate them, meaning we set the preflow equal to the capacity. Flow everywhere else is zero. For all other edges. Notice that f is a f is not a flow, obviously, right? Because these vertices, you know, right at, right one hop beyond s, they have way more stuff coming in, and they have zero going out. So conservation is violated, but we do have a preflow. The flow in is only bigger than the flow out. So f of preflow plus the invariance. Okay. Why do the invariants hold? Well, the only possible problem, right, because all the heights are zero except for, except for the source S, the only possible problem where edges going out of S, and by construction we remove those from the residual graph through saturation. Okay? Everyone clear on the, on the initialization? We can't, of course, I mean, we have a lot of work to do, right? I mean, so we have this preflow, but it's not a flow, and it's nowhere close to being a flow. Okay? But at least we have the invariants. And I'm going to show you a main loop that will keep the invariant satisfied and will work toward restoring feasibility. We'll terminate with a feasible flow. Questions? All right, so the main loop, well, what are we trying to do? We have a preflow that's not a flow. So there, that is, remember, that means positive excesses. So we want to somehow squash these excesses. Right? So the main while loop is just going to look for a vertex that has excess. So while there exists a vertex, again, other than the source and sink, that has excess, now in general, there's going to be a lot of such vertices. Okay? And among them all, there's different ways you can implement push relabel algorithms, but I'm going to tell you about sort of a very practical one, uh, which is you always pick the one with the highest height. Okay? So if there's multiple vertices with excesses, you look at the current height function, the h function, and you look at the one with the biggest h value. Okay? So choose such a v with biggest height. And if there's a tie, you can break the tie arbitrarily. 
So now, you're always going to prioritize pushing. Okay? So if it's possible, right, so you have a vertex V, it has excess, you want to get rid of the excess, so you want to push, remember this subroutine, you want to push on an outgoing edge, okay? if possible. If not, that's when we're going to do the second step called the relabel. Okay? But first, let's just say if it's possible to push, then you go ahead and do it. So why would you not be allowed, so how could you not push? Um, well, yeah, so this will jump in the gun a little bit. Okay. So here's going to be the condition under which we allow a push to happen. So if there's an outgoing edge from V in the residual graph that goes downhill. Okay? Now, if it goes downhill, it can only go downhill by one. We know that. But there might be some edges going out of V which go downhill. Okay? So if there is such an edge, then uh, we push. Um, on V. Okay? And I should also say, you know, when we go into the push subroutine, we're going to push flow on this same kind of edge. Okay? So in the final algorithm, only push on an edge Vw that goes downhill with h of v equal h of w plus one. Okay. So, for example, if this vertex v had excess and we called push on this vertex v, we'd be fine, right? Because there is an edge indeed which goes downhill, so we'd satisfy the if condition. And then when we get inside push, we would just route the appropriate amount of flow from V to W1, okay? because it flows downhill. Now, a totally other possibility is that the height, the height function assigns V a 2. Okay? And so all of the edges outgoing from V go uphill. So that would be a case, but and this can happen even though V has excess. So in that case, this if statement is not satisfied, and something else has to happen. Okay? Okay. So what's the other thing that happens? Well, you do a relabel, which just means you increment the height of V by one. Okay. So else increment V's height. And this is known as a relabel. Okay. And that's the entire push relabel algorithm that we're going to talk about. Yep. Yep. Any edge that meets this property is okay. I mean, in an implementation, it would be natural to do the same one. But as far as everything I'll say today, all that's important is that it's pushed on a downhill edge. And so this is just saying it's like, well, you know, if there is no downhill edge, I'm not going to try to force you to push. This is check for a downhill edge. If there is at least one, push on an arbitrary downhill edge. And that'll be fine. Good question. Other questions? Yep. Why is the invariant height um, satisfied when all the heights are zero in the beginning? Wouldn't, um, wouldn't that not satisfy one edge being one higher than the other? So remember, it's only for edges in the residual graph that the height condition uh, matters. So it's definitely important, so you know, as we discussed, it's important you don't use the all zero flow. Then you'd have a violation, right? But so the point is, with this height function, the only possible edges which might go downhill too quickly are the ones going from S to some of the vertex. And that's exactly why we saturate all those edges in the initialization to make sure they disappear from the residual graph. So again, unless I say otherwise, the residual graph, I delete all edges with zero residual capacity. Other questions? So again, so there's a lot of things which are not clear. It's not clear this terminates, okay? So that shouldn't be obvious, let alone that it should be polynomial running time. It also shouldn't be clear it's correct, okay? But I just want you to be able to parse the code. I feel like you could code this up in Python very quickly. Any questions at that level? <laughs> 
All right, so this algorithm works great. So for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to explain the senses in which it works great. Okay, now, so I'm not going to do it as a programming project or anything, but I encourage you to code this up if you ever, so, well, I mean, you can also just download Max Flow code, which uses this algorithm from the web, but you can also, of course, implement it yourself uh, pretty quickly if you're a good coder. It's a pretty simple algorithm. Okay, so let's, as usual, I'm going to talk about correctness for a little bit before proceeding to the running time. So the first thing I want to notice is that the invariants, at least, are maintained. Right, if this wasn't true, we'd be in big trouble, right? Because what are we hoping? We're hoping at the end of this algorithm, oh, I guess one thing I should say is, you know, notice by our termination condition, if the algorithm terminates, it definitely terminates with a flow, right? Because all the excesses have to be zero, okay, for the while loop to exit. So we definitely have feasibility restored at the end of this algorithm if it ever terminates. All right, and so then what we have in mind, our strategy, our plan for solving the max flow problem is we're gonna have feasibility at the end and then we're gonna have these invariants which imply that S and T are disconnected in the residual graph which implies that we're optimal. So it better be true that every single operation we ever do doesn't break any of the invariants. Okay, so the first two invariants are fine. We never relabel the source, we never relabel the sink. Okay, so the heights of S and T stay in and zero forevermore. So it's this third invariant that we have to think about. And the algorithm does two different things. It can either push or it can do a relabel. Okay, and we have to argue for both of them, that neither one can mess up the invariant. So how about a relabel? Well, so let's remember what the invariant says. It says edges in the residual graph can only go downhill gradually, okay, by one step. So what's, under what condition are we going to relabel a vertex? Well, the only time we ever relabel a vertex is if all of the edges out of it stay flat or go up, okay? So if that's the case, and we only raise its height by one, after we do that, any of the outgoing edges, if they go down, they can only go down by one step. Okay? So just by the entering condition of the else clause, there's no way we can screw up the invariant with a relabel. We really make sure that we're not going to screw it up before we bother to do the relabel. So how about a push? What could conceivably go wrong with a push? So a push doesn't change anybody's heights, right? So the h values stay exactly the same. On the other hand, the push can change the residual graph. Okay. You sent flow on an edge, so if the reverse arc wasn't there in the residual graph, it suddenly appears. So that's what could possibly go wrong. Okay. You augment along an edge, you get the reverse arc, it's conceivable this new edge violates the third invariant. But actually, and this is the whole reason why we insist on pushing flow downhill. Right. So notice what this says. Right. So this says, you only push if there's an outgoing edge that goes downhill. And in the push algorithm, we only ever push on an on a, on a edge that goes downhill. So if we push on an edge that goes downhill, the reverse arc goes uphill. Okay? And that's fine. The invariant just says things can't go downhill too quickly. <coughs> things can go uphill, it's fine. Okay? So that's the claim. Any questions about that? Again, the upshot here is if the algorithm terminates, it can only terminate with a max flow. It's feasible by the termination condition, and it's optimal by the invariance. All right. So before we do the running time analysis, uh, I want to do sort of a detailed example, okay? because I know it's sort of probably a little bit abstract until we trace through what this algorithm actually does. So let's go back to our network where some of the capacities are really big, but the max flow value is actually only three. Okay, so this is what this network looked like. So what's the algorithm, how's the algorithm going to work? Okay. Well, so we need to initialize, and again, that means both the heights and the preflow. So these are all zero heights, so green is going to denote the heights. 
What's the height of S? Four, right? This is four vertices. Um, blue, I'll put the flow amounts in blue. So we initially saturate all the edges going out of S. So we're going to route one unit of flow on this arc and 100 units of flow on this arc. And remember, we already know the max flow value here is three. Okay, so there's 100 units going sort of southeast. So that's going to come back to home, to home to roost at some point. Okay. All right, so maybe in purple, I'll put the excesses, right? So as soon as you do this push, you have excesses. You have an excess of one at V, and you have an excess of 100 at W. Okay? So that's the initialization. Everyone on board? All right. So now we enter the main loop. How does the main loop work? Well, we say, well, if there's no vertices with excesses, we're done. So if there are vertices with excesses, pick the one that has the biggest height. So we have two vertices with excess, both V and W. They both have height zero. So here we can choose arbitrarily. Let's choose V. Okay. So we get to V. And the algorithm says, OK, I want to push flow. I want to get rid of V's excess if I can. So what do I do? I scan the outgoing arcs, and I see if any of them go downhill. Okay, And then if so, I'm going to send flow on it. So does V have any arcs that goes downhill right now? No. It has height zero, right? So outgoing arcs can only go, stay flat or go up. So this triggers the relabel step. And so V is going to be relabeled one. Okay. It occurs to me I should also, the residual graph is going to keep changing. So maybe in pink I'll say what the reverse arcs are. Okay. So remember blue is the flow. Okay. So now next iteration we again say look at the vertices with excess. They're the same as before. They're V and W. Look at the one that it's the highest. And now we don't have a choice. Okay, so now we're definitely going to invoke push on V again. Okay? Because it's now, it has the higher label than W. So at this point, does V have any outgoing arcs which go downhill? Yeah, which one? There's actually two of them, right? So the arc from V to W goes downhill, and the arc from V to T goes downhill. And again, the algorithm, as we're going to analyze it, can decide arbitrarily. And so we're probably rooting for the algorithm to send that unit straight home to T. But just to make it interesting, let's assume it doesn't do that. Let's assume that the algorithm routes the one unit here. So then the excess here goes from 1 to 0. The excess at W goes up 1 from 100 to 101. And now we get sort of a residual arc here, a reverse arc with a residual capacity one, corresponding to undoing that flow. Okay? Everyone with me? Okay. All right, so now we go back to the main loop. And so now notice there's only a single vertex that has excess, W. Okay, excess 101. So we're definitely going to go to that next. So right now it has height zero. So certainly there's not going to be any outgoing arcs which go downhill. So clearly we're going to relabel this thing to one. Next iteration, we pick W again. We again scan for downhill outgoing arcs. Are there any at this point? Yeah, which one? To T, right? From W to T goes downhill. T is anchored at zero. So what's going to happen is uh, we'll push as much flow as possible from W to T. Now, because this edge has capacity only one, it's not much. Okay, you're just going to push the one unit of flow down uh, along here. Okay. So this becomes one unit you get a reverse arc and the excess drops back down to 100. Okay. All right, so next iteration, we again pick W because it still has excess. At this point in the current residual graph, does W have any outgoing arcs that go downhill? Well, the only outgoing arcs are, it has these outgoing arcs going to V, but that's, those are flat edges, right, 1, 1. And then there's, in the residual graph, there's this edge going from W to S. That's outgoing from W, but S has height 4, so this goes from height 1 to 4, it goes uphill. Okay, so two of them are flat, the parallel edges are flat, the other one is uphill. So no, we cannot push on W right now. <laughs> 
So we go to the, so what do we do? So we relabel. So now next time we again pick W and we scan for outgoing arcs which go downhill. And now notice we have some arcs, right? So the two arcs which go back to V, okay, so the one that was originally in the network plus the reverse arc of the flow that we pushed south previously, those both go from height two to height one. So when we push, so now at this point we can push from W to V. Let me just kind of do all this at once. So we're going to undo the flow that we previously sent from V to W. So let me erase this reverse arc, make that zero. And then we're also going to saturate the edge from the original graph that goes from W to V. Okay. What does the excess now become at W? How much did it go down by? Two. Two. That's right. So it, it got rid of one unit on this one, and it got rid of one on that reverse arc, which I erased. Okay? And so that excess just shows up at V. Um, from V to W? Oh, yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's not going to matter for us, but you're totally right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so the excess drops here by two. It goes up here by two. Okay. Now what happens next? So now actually notice we used to only have one edge with excess. Now we have two edges with uh, two vertices with excess again. Okay, so again, it's not immediately clear this is making sort of monotone progress in any sense. All right. So what happens next? Well, so now we go back and we say, oh, there's two vertices with excess. Of those, I pick the one with the with the higher up. So that's going to be W, right? So W is going to be chosen next, again, by the algorithm. So at this stage, are there any edges outgoing from W that go downhill? There are not, okay? In fact, um, really the only edge which is still in the residual graph going out of W is the one going back to S. Okay, so the unique outgoing arc in the residual graph goes to a node with height four, so W is going to be relabeled. It's going to be related. There's still, you know, still the only outgoing edge goes from three to four. It's relabeled again. Now the only outgoing edge is flat. It's going to be relabeled again. And now finally, at this point, it's going to send its excess of 98 back to the source when it where it disappears. Okay. And again, if you think about it, we knew this had to happen. We know the max flow value is three. So we should have been eyeing this 100 with a lot of skepticism. So that reduces this to two. Let me just erase this residual arc. There are residual arcs, but the picture's getting too complicated. So the point is the excess here goes down to zero. So now in the final iteration, we say, okay, which vertices still have excesses? Well, V has an excess. It's the only one that does. So we go here and we say, are there any edges outgoing from V which go downhill? There is, right? So basically from V to T goes downhill. So even though V is only at height one, T is at height zero. So in the final iteration, V discharges its excess and that gets sent on the edge from V to T. And this is the maximum flow that we computed other, uh, previously by seemingly simpler means, okay? So obviously there is networks where push relabel does much more straightforward execution. I could even make choices in this network so that it executes much more straightforwardly. But I wanted you to sort of appreciate why the analysis we're going to do, you know, has to have some arguments. Okay, really some, you know, there's no really obvious, you know, monotonicity argument that says every single push or relabel something good happens. Okay, we have to sort of go in through the outdoor a little bit and have a more indirect argument. Okay. Good. So questions about the example or about the algorithm? Yep. In the end, are the height values guaranteed to be the same even if we make different choices during the procedure? That's a good question. I believe not. So, I mean, pretty much all the algorithms we've done so far are, un are underspecified. I mean, it's really obvious in Ferguson. Uh, 
um, where the path can change its iteration. Now, of course, you wind up with the same flow at the end, which is maybe your point. If you have a correct max flow algorithm, you obviously are going to get the same flow if there's unique max flow. Here, we don't really care about the height function per se. Um, that's just really a way to organize the pushes to make sure we make healthy progress. So we kind of don't really care that different executions can result in different height functions because we throw that away at the end of the computation anyways. It's a good question. Other questions? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a lot to say other than what I said previously. So, I mean, it, it was known since the 50s that what you want to be striving for is a residual graph um, with no ST path, where you want to disconnect S and T. And so I think there's sort of, there's sort of this really key insight, um, you know, which in hindsight, like it feels very natural, but you can imagine why it would take people a long time to think of like switching it around and saying, actually, you know, if that's what we, if that's what we really want, we really want to disconnect S and T, can we have an algorithm which just, forget about a termination, at every single point, it has S and T disconnected. Okay, but well then you have to relax something else. You're not just gonna initialize with a max flow. And sort of the only other thing you have to work with is, um, the con is feasibility. So you know, you could try to relax like capacity constraints, but then that seems very difficult to try to restore. So instead, it's natural to relax conservation constraints. Also, you know, I think one thing that does come up to people's minds pretty naturally is this flooding idea where you just try to like push as much out of S as you can and then just you know get it to T and if you can't get it to T then route it back and that also naturally motivates why you kind of have this um, flow in bigger than flow out and then really the height function I mean the, the, you know these invariants for the height function um, you know I can see how they seem a little out of nowhere but um, I think you know later in this course I think it'll feel more natural because you'll have seen more examples you're right, the first, per the, the first person at some point had to have an argument like this, and that takes, a, that takes some insight. But, but that's a sort of, um, this kind of a recipe for these optimality conditions. Um, and that's one of the things I'm hoping to sort of convey by example after example throughout the course. Yeah. But certainly, I mean, you know, it, you know as, as best as I can, I try to make it feel like, you know, you could have come up with this algorithm, you know, very naturally, step by step. Um, you know, and, and for many algorithms, and many of you, I do believe that's true. I'm not lying. But, um, you know, sometimes you kind of step back and just admire, like, a, a leap of insight. You're like, yeah, I may, I may not have come up with that myself. So I'm glad you proved it, and I can just check the proof. I can just learn the proof, you know. So but that's what's cool about, you know, math and proofs. Like, one person proves it, it's true for everybody, right? And then usually verifying it, it's much easier uh, than proving it in the first place, which is more or less the P versus MP question. So in hindsight, this kind of seems like we are doing Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. So, I mean, there, there's some intuition that maybe there's a cut going on at the same time, where you know you look at the high labels and the low labels, and there's some corresponding cut, and you can tweak push for label algorithms so that that becomes a formal correspondence. Actually, last year I put that on a problem set. This year I'm not going to. Um, so, if you want, you can sort of think about the height function as encoding a cut in some sense. Yeah, we're not going to need that for the analysis though. Okay, so, what, uh, so what's actually true about this? So here's, uh, here's what we're gonna prove. This is due to Goldberg and Tarjan, again, back in the mid 80s. Um, so this push for label algorithm terminates after O of n squared relabels and O of n cubed pushes. So the most a quadratic number of relabels. I'm going to prove that first. And then piggybacking on this, I'm going to prove there can be at most a cubic number of pushes. So this theorem, for simplicity, I'm just going to focus on the number of times each operation is invoked. Each time you do a push, each time you do a relabel. That's not the same as a running time analysis of an algorithm. For the algorithm, you really have to keep track of all the work the algorithm does, not just necessarily pushes and relabels. So on the second exercise set, I'll ask you to think about how would you actually implement this in cubic time. So cubic running time. What makes this at least slightly non-trivial? What makes this slightly non-trivial is the requirement that when there are many nodes with excess, 
you're responsible for choosing the one with the biggest height. Okay, so you need to be a little bit smart to think about how to keep track of vertices with excess so that you can always find the highest such vertex in constant time. Okay, you could always use like a balanced search tree to do it in log time, but actually the structure of this problem means you can even do it in constant time. Okay, but I'll ask you to think about that outside of class. I'm going to focus just on bounding the number of times these operations are invoked. Okay. All right. So, let's see. Do I have room on this board? Not really. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you can remember what a push is. So, let me state a key lemma. If there's time, I'll prove this today. Otherwise, I'll prove it at the beginning of Thursday. What I want to focus on is more why this key lemma implies the running time bound or the operation count bound. So what's the lemma say? It says consider any graph, any preflow f, and consider any vertex that has excess. Okay, so if the excess is positive, then the claim is there exists a path from v to s in the corresponding residual graph. Okay? So you may not really know what to make of this lemma the first time you see it. Let me first just point out that there's a very strong intuition for why this lemma should be true. Okay? You've got a vertex, it has excess. What does that mean? That means the flow in is bigger than the flow out. Okay? Well, this flow that's coming in, it had to come from somewhere. And it basically came from the source originally. So there should be some way of just kind of undoing it and looking at a path of reverse arcs in the residual graph that leads back to S from V. Okay, the flow got there somehow. You should be able to undo it, get back to S. Okay? Again, I'll give you a formal proof for completeness, but that's morally why this is true. Now, it's not obvious why this lemma is useful, but that'll become clear shortly. All right, so let me show you how you can very quickly derive the bound of the number of relabels from the key lemma. Okay, and remember the claim is that the number of relabels is O of n squared. Okay, so why is that true? So corollary, the point is this key lemma bounds above how high a vertex can ever go. Okay? So the claim is, is at most h of s plus n minus 1, and as always is the number of vertices. The source remembers at height n, so this is going to be 2n minus 1. This is a variant on an argument we had earlier. Okay, so again, a vertex V has excess. Assuming the key lemma is true, there's a path from V to S in the residual graph. This path can only have N minus one edges in it. And edges go downhill gradually by one, by one each time. And the source is anchored at N. So if you start at V, you traverse a path of at most N minus one edges, and you went down by a most one each time step, and you end up at N, you could only have started at 2N minus one. Okay, you couldn't have started any higher than that. You couldn't have got down to N sufficiently quickly. Okay? So the key lemma immediately tells us that the heights of vertices cannot become unbounded, and this is the thin end of the wedge. From this, we'll be able to derive the rest of the analysis. So in particular, this immediately gives us a quadratic bound on the number of relabels. Okay. Why? Well, don't forget, we only ever relabel a vertex if it has excess. We don't just like randomly increment you know, vertices that are already fine. Okay? So whenever you relabel, it has excess. When it has excess, that height isn't very big. So at the end of the algorithm, nobody's going to have height bigger than 2n minus 1. 
Now there's only n vertices, so that means a quadratic number of relabels overall. Of course, we're also using that heights never go, uh, never go down. They can only go up, okay? So it's the most O of n per vertex, the most n squared relabels overall, okay? So any questions about the relabel analysis? Yep. So do you see why it's at most O of n per vertex? So the height of a vertex can't get too big. Right. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So every relabel of a vertex increases its height. Mm -hmm. So if the height can only be O of n, wow. it can only be relabeled O of n times. There's n vertices, so that's O of n squared relabels overall. Other questions? Okay. So we're going to piggyback on this relabeling bound and derive a bound on the number of pushes. And there's really two different kinds of pushes, and we really need to think about them separately. Why are there two kinds of pushes? Well, remember, when we choose delta, the residue of which is still up here, okay, so we're in a push, we could be constrained by one of two things, okay? We can't push more than the residual capacity of this edge. On the other hand, we can't push more than the excess of the vertex. Okay, so there's an edge constraint and a vertex constraint, okay? So if it's the case that it's the edge that's constraining, okay, so you push a flow equal to the residual capacity of the outgoing edge, no surprise, that's what's called a non uh, excuse me, a saturating push, because you saturate the edge that you're pushing on. The other kind is called the non-saturating edge, okay? So let's first think about saturating pushes. And again, this is the case where delta equals where again, delta is how much flow you augment equals residual capacity of your edge E. Okay? So let's argue that not too many of these can happen over the entire trajectory of the push relabel algorithm. So what are we worried about? You know, we're worried that we have some edge VW and, you know, we keep running this algorithm, you know, and basically we just keep doing saturated pushes on this edge over and over and over and over and over again. Maybe it even happens forever. Who knows? Okay. So how do we say that can't happen? Well, you know, run the algorithm to completion and look back over all of the operations that it did. It did a push on this edge, it did a relabel on this vertex, a push on this, a push on this, a push on this, a relabel of this, etc. Okay. Look, so fix your favorite edge from V to W. Isolate two consecutive times where the algorithm did a saturating push from V to W. Okay, so maybe it did it seven times total. Okay, so look for example at the third time it did a saturating push on VW and the fourth time. And we want to think about everything which happens in between. Okay? And so the claim is that in that time window, there have to be some relabels. So between two saturating pushes of an edge VW, and so I, what I mean, and I mean this in the same direction, okay, so forward along VW both times, two saturating pushes of VW, each of VW in the meantime has been relabeled at least twice. Okay? So that's the claim. So we're not going to say that you can't do many saturating pushes of a given arc. You can. But between each pair, consecutive, um, consecutive saturating push, there have to be at least two relabels of V and W each in between. Now notice if the claim is true, a vertex can only be labeled O of n times. Right? That's part of our relabeling analysis. A vertex can only be relabeled O of n times. So if each pair of saturating pushes trigger, triggers two relabels of the endpoints, how many times can this one edge be have a saturating push? Also O of n, right? So the endpoints can only go up O of n times. Each of this triggers going up, so you have O of n uh, per edge. So summing over all edges, that's M n over all. Okay? So this is even stronger than what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove n cubed pushes, and nm, you know, is at worst n cubed, and generally it's smaller. Okay, so this is actually stronger than what we need to prove. 
All right, so why is this true? Well, think about the first time you do a saturating push from V to W, okay? We only push downhill, right? So the first time we do a saturating push, it has to be the case that, for example, this is height five and this is height four or something else, okay? They differ by one, it goes downhill. This is a saturating push. What does that mean? That means this edge gets saturated, so it vanishes from the residual graph. Okay? So the saturating push deletes the edge from the residual graph. So how could it be that we ever have another saturating push in the same direction from V to W? Well, that can't happen until this arc reappears in the residual graph. What causes it to reappear in the residual graph? A push in the opposite direction from W to V. Okay? So a prerequisite for have, seeing a second saturating push from V to W is to see a push back from W to V. Now, pushes only go downhill. So if there's ever a push from W to V, it has to be the case that W is six or more, okay? Because heights never go down. So for it to go downhill, Right, so initially we have V flowing downhill to W. For it to go backward, W needs to be raised two steps at least to be above V. Okay, and now to have a second saturating push in the original direction from V to W, now of course, you know, again, it can only flow downhill. So this can't happen until V has retaken its superior position over W, which requires it being relabeled at least twice. Okay. So for the second saturating push, we have some situation like this, okay? So that's the, that's the proof for the saturating pushes at most O of M times N. Any questions about that? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Again, you know, think of it this way. So think of it in the original network. Um, think of it, you collapse parallel edges. So if you have edges with capacities 7, 12, and 19, uh, you know, you just add them up and have an edge of cost 38, or capacity 38. Um, for the residual graph, you know, you might have two copies in each direction. You know, I'm happy to sort of live with the two copies each direction, but I don't want an unbounded number of copies. And again, for max flow, it's silly. There's no reason to have parallel edges. You may as well just amalgamate their, their capacities. So that's why M is at most O of N squared. Yeah. All right. Other questions? All right, so how about the non-saturating pushes? So in the detailed example we did, we certainly saw examples of both. Some of those pushes were saturating, some were non-saturating. Remember, non-saturating, what does this mean? This means that the bottleneck is the excess of the vertex. So where delta, the amount of stuff that you push, is equal to the excess at V, all right? So with a saturating push, we sort of had a notion of progress that the edge disappears from the residual graph. Maybe that was a good thing. For a non-saturating push, what kind of progress occurs? Well, the excess gets zeroed out at V, right? So that's what's good about a non-saturating push, is V used to have excess, now its excess has gone down to zero, okay? So we need to somehow leverage that. Okay. So proof, oh right, so claim. Oh, one other thing. In the algorithm, when there are multiple vertices with excesses, we're doing some kind of, we have a rule for which one we pick. We pick the one that's the highest, okay? Nothing I have told you so far actually uses the fact that we're picking the highest excess vertex, okay? So if that's somehow useful for us, this is the part of the analysis where it's going to happen in the final non-saturating push analysis. Okay. So again, run the algorithm to completion and look back in hindsight at all the operations it ever did. Pushes, relabels, blah, 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 blah. 
Now look at a time window bracketed by two consecutive relabels, not necessarily of the same vertex. Okay, so we have a relabel of some, you know, the fifth vertex, a whole bunch of different pushes, and then a relabel of like the twelfth vertex. Okay, so we're zooming in on that kind of time window. So what can happen in between these two relabels? Well, the claim is only so many non-saturating pushes can happen. Okay, between two relabels, we have at most n non-saturating pushes. Okay? That's the claim. If the claim is true, we're done. We already know there's only a quadratic number of relabels. If there's only not O of n non-saturating pushes between each pair, we have at most a cubic number of such pushes. Okay? Which is the theorem. All right? So we're done with the theorem, the analysis of Goldberg Tarjan, except I need to prove the claim, which I'll do now. And I, there's also the key lemma, but I'll, I'll save that till Thursday. Okay? So proof of claim. So suppose there's a non-saturating push at the vertex V. So this vertex used to have excess, we do a push, now it doesn't have excess. So by our choice of V, meaning because amongst all vertices with excess, we chose the highest one, certainly at the time of this non-saturating push, we can say that V has height at least as big as anything else with excess. Okay, that's just sort of immediate, that's just by definition. But what's a little more interesting is that this remains true until the next relabel. So at the time we chose V, certainly among everything with excess, it was the highest. Right? That's just our algorithm. Now, assume there's no more relabel for a while. We're just pushing stuff around. We only push on edges that go downhill. Okay? So these pushes can create new vertices with excess, but each newly created vertex with an excess is height even smaller than the vertex where it got the flow from. So if at the beginning, V has the highest height of anything with an excess, and the vertices with excess just keep getting lower and lower. Indeed, at the end, V is also going to have height, at least that of any other node with excess. Okay? So this is true when we choose V by definition of the algorithm. This is true because flow only goes downhill. Good. By the same reasoning, So the non-saturating push, by definition, it squashes the excess completely. Okay, so V is excess zero after the non-saturating push. The worry is that at some other point later, someone pushes flow back to V and it has excess again. This cannot happen until the next relabel. Why not? Well, where would V get this flow from? Flow only goes downhill. So we'd have to get it from a node with excess that's even higher, <laughs> but there are never any such nodes until there's a relabel. Okay? So V maintains its sort of height dominance over everybody with excesses until there's some relabel. Good. So this implies the most N non-saturating pushes uh, until the next relabel. Right, so if you go a full n iterations, if you have n non-saturating pushes without seeing a relabel, you've squashed all the excesses down to zero one by one. Okay, so again, n non-saturating pushes without a relabel, you just have everything excess zero, and the algorithm stops. Okay, so if the algorithm to keep going, you have to keep seeing relabels, at least one every n non-saturating pushes, giving us the cubic bound on the number of non-saturating pushes.
questions? So you should believe the theorem modulo the proof of the key lemma. The key lemma is the one that says anything with excess has a path back to the source in the residual graph. So I still need to prove that to you. I claim I've proven everything else about the theorem. So if that's not clear, so you should ask a question about it. Question? Yep. Do you explain how the last uh, statement is like? This one? Yeah. Sure. So um, a non-saturating push at V reduces its excess to zero. And until there's a relabel, it will never become positive again. So for every non-saturating push before relabel, that's one more vertex whose excess you've zeroed out. So every non-saturating push makes the excess zero. Right. It can't become positive. So if I've done 10 different non-saturating pushes, I've got 10 different vertices that all have excess zero. Oh, okay. If I've done n of them, everybody has excess zero. But that means I have a flow and the algorithm's done. Other questions? All right, so we'll kick off Thursday with a proof of the key lemma, and then we'll move on to applications of max flow and min cut.